Hi, everyone. My name is Grace Leslie, and I'm speaking to you from the FIRST Center, which is on the Georgia Tech uh, campus in Atlanta. Um, at Georgia Tech, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Music, and I run the Brain Music Lab, which is part of the Center for Music Technology. I would like to note to everybody that um, the Georgia Tech School of Music has several uh, degree programs in music technology, and I'd really like to encourage you um, to visit our website at music.gatech.edu to learn more. This year marks the 23rd Guthman Music Instrument Competition, which is an annual event that is aimed at identifying the world's next generation of musical instruments and the best new ideas in musicality, design, and engineering. For the first 11 years, the competition was actually a, a piano performance contest, transitioning to a musical instrument competition in 2009. The first Guthman competition began, began with eight high school students, um, and this year the Guthman competition will, will host over a dozen uh, inventors from all over the world. Wired Magazine called uh, uh, the Guthman competition an X Prize for music, uh, and uh, contestants have likened it to a, a TED conference for new musical instrument designers. Some of our previous finalists include the OP1, um, the Rolly Seaboard, the Guitar Bot, and many other groundbreaking, groundbreaking musical instruments, which have since, since become successful commercially and artistically. Um, first off, I wanted to show you all uh, an example of one of our past participants in our competition. This was actually the um, winner um, of last year's competition called The Spit. <laughs> So I would like to urge everyone to look at our finalist video gallery and vote for your favorites for this year's competition. Um, that website is at guthman.godtech.edu slash gallery. So I'd like to introduce our first panelist um, that we have that has um, joined us here today. Roger Lin is a creator of electronic music products best known for the 1979 LM1 drum computer, the first sampled sound drum machine. It introduced the concepts of timing correction and swing to innovations that made real-time programming practical. Together with the 1982 Lin drum and the 1984 Lin 9000, these instruments provided the drums for countless 1980s hits by Prince, Michael Jackson, Peter Gabriel, Madonna, and many others. He then worked with the Akai company to design the 1988 MPC-60 and the 1991 MPC-3000 drum machines, which became the industry standards for hip hop and dance music productions. In the 2000s, he created the Adrenaline series of guitar processors, bringing the sequenced filter processing of modular synthesis to a, sample, to a simple guitar pedal. Uh, in 2015, he turned his, his attention to bringing the performance expression of acoustic instruments to electronic sound with the Linstrument Expressive MIDI controller. 
Uh, he is the recipient of the 2011 Technical Grammy Award. So Roger, um, I just wanted to uh, get our conversation started uh, with the question that was submitted to us from our audience. Um, they wanted to know if you could discuss your strategies and challenges for overcome uh, to uh, overcome in producing an instrument for commercial production. Um, and what are some of the best avenues for that? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that it's a pleasure to be a part of this discussion. And uh, when I've been to Georgia Tech before for the, the Guffman competitions, it was, it was a wonderful event and so many young creative minds um, and so many great ideas. It was, uh, I had a marvelous time. Uh, anyway, regarding your question, um, it is a challenge uh, often making products because uh, there's always balances between uh, opposing needs. Uh, for example, you need to make something as good as possible, but you need to make it cheap enough that uh, people can afford it. Um, you need to be able to have um, it manufacturable. It has to be reliable. Um, and there are just thousands of things that you learn over the years on uh, uh, how to avoid uh, pitfalls um, in, in design. Uh, and so what I try to do is, is um, I'm small time. You know, my company is basically just me with outsourced manufacturing and shipping and the help from a few engineer friends uh, in design. But um, I, I have to keep things very uh, small. And, uh, and because my market is small for things like the instrument here, I have to, um, I, I don't have the, uh, the ability to make tens of thousands of them uh, uh, to bring the cost down. So, for example, in the instrument here, I had to use uh, every trick I could to be able to get its, its um, uh, pressure sensitive multi sensing, multi touch sensing. Um, so, it's, I guess in general, I would just say it's, it's lots and lots of, of compromises. And the other thing too is, is um, you know, our industry is very unique in that, um, first of all, uh, um, products tend to have a fairly short life cycle. Uh, so there's a lot of engineering involved and then it just sort of goes up and, and goes down. Uh, the other thing too is musicians are just cheap bastards. Uh, they don't want to pay too much for things. So you always have to be cognizant about that um, in when you're designing a product. But in general, what I try to do is, is I've never been good at the business stuff, but I think I'm pretty good about making the musical instruments. And I try to focus on that and use the experience that I've had to, um, to try to um, uh, make things that, uh, for, a, for a reasonable price uh, that provide good quality and new musical instruments. In fact, it's funny, uh, often uh, young creators, like many of the people at the, the Guffman competition, will ask me, how can I bring my idea to market? How can I have it patented? Um, how can I uh, protect my ideas? Things like that. And so I actually made an FAQ on my website. Uh, there's an FAQ page, and, and it asks that question. And it starts off in my answer and says, of all the ways to lose all your money, making a prototype of your idea is one of the most effective. Um, and what it basically does is give some suggestions about how to prove your concept in a way that doesn't cost much money. Uh, you know, often people say things like, I'm going to make a prototype and I'll go to a prototyping company and the company will say, oh, it'll cost $50,000, $60,000. I'll do it. Uh, but then they don't realize all the other things that are involved. So um, it's important to, uh, you know, keep your costs down and, and then, you know, focus on the, the prize, which is to make a, a better musical instrument. So how did you go about uh, prototyping the instrument and what was your um, kind of ideal um, audience for this particular instrument? Well, it's a tough one because it's a new type of instrument, and so it doesn't have a big audience at first. I've only sold uh, uh, 2,600 of them so far, so it's not a big seller like a, you know, a um, well any sort of big music product, you know, a, an, a, an MPC or, or a, a Ableton Push or something like that. Um, so what I did is I, I tried to use available development tools because I know. Uh, software, I know hardware design, I know engineering design, but only enough to get in trouble. <laughs> I don't know them uh, all very well, so I have people helping me out when it gets down to the details. But for example, uh, in writing the software for this, uh, there's a wonderful system of, uh, of, of uh, software development for hardware products called the Arduino. And it's, um, it's very, very cheap. And 
I knew that I wanted the software for the instrument to be open source so anyone could do whatever they want with it. And so I thought I'd base it on the Arduino because people know that it's easy to use. And so uh, the hardware inside is actually based on the, one of the higher powered Arduino uh, circuit cards. It doesn't use one, it uses the circuit and then all my other circuitry around it. But other than that, I just tried to use things that are cheap. Like for example, uh, the instrument has sort of a nice uh, rounded uh, design to it and it's thin. And so um, to do that, uh, uh, I decided how can I get that rounded design without paying for the high cost of plastic molds uh, that would make that nice rounded design. So I just instead used the standard sheet metal to make a rectangular box and then you can buy at the lumber yard these pieces of wood. They use them for wainscoting uh, for houses. They're one inch half round pieces of wood and you just drill some holes in them and you stick them on and all of a sudden you've got a nice sexy shape. The other thing too is that I wanted it to be very thin because thin is in. But the trouble is these uh, MIDI jacks, the only jacks, MIDI jacks that people make are fairly high. So what I do in manufacturing is I just snip them off the tops of them so they fit inside the box so the whole thing's only half an inch thin. Uh, so it's all kinds of just uh, crazy tricks like that. Uh, and, um, and then and being willing to take a chance down again. Uh, but you make a calculated risk because you want the thing to always work in, in the field. So uh, stuff like that. I'm also wondering if you could explain to us uh, a little bit about how the Linstrument interface works. Um, we had another question from the audience um, that was asking um, about how you can balance giving the performer control over the sound without overwhelming them with information while they're performing. Uh, and I'm wondering Excellent. how you kind of uh, approach that and how you design the Linstrument. Well, excellent question. In fact, what, I'm, what I try to do in the instrument is make an instrument that you don't have to think about technical details, but you do a little bit because it's a MIDI controller and a MIDI controller doesn't have sounds built in. The sounds are in your computer and your iPad or your hardware synthesizer. So it's a little bit like buying a car without an engine. You know, you have to select your engine, right? But at the same time, um, what I try to do is make it easy enough to connect with popular synthesizers, and I recommend synthesizers, and it actually works with every MIDI synthesizer in the world. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I try to make an instrument where people can focus on the music, playing the music. And so you asked about the hum human interface for it. What it is, there's 200 little notepads, not unlike the drum pad notepads, uh, drum pads that you find on a... a a drum pad controller, but instead of playing drums, they're intending to play musical notes. And there's eight rows of 25 notes each. And so the layout of those notes is just like any stringed instrument. Uh, there's a series of chromatics. <laughs> and the lights on it, I don't know if you can see that, but the lights just tell you where the naturals are in the C major scale or any other scale you choose. The, the C is always in blue, and then uh, there's C sharp, not lit, then D, lit, D sharp, not lit. And then of course it responds to, to three dimensions of touch, pressure, pitch, and the third dimension, in this case it's timbre, and the re oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> just to finish though, the reason I don't use the standard piano key layout is that the pitches aren't equally spaced, so you can't do any of these gest gestures like this. And it's also, it's called, it's what's called isomorphic, so if I want to play a scale, it's the same fingering in any key. And so that's the reason for this. And it's actually, it's called, this note layout is called the fourth string layout. It's used in Ableton Push. It's used in Rolly's light pad block instrument. It's used in an app called the Geo Shred. It's becoming a new standard for expressive control or just for playing. And uh, I think it's a good idea because, um, you know, the main reason that piano has all its keys in a long line 
is a few centuries ago, there had to be a string behind each key. And so it's kind of funny for me when I see people playing these plastic electronic keyboards because there's no strings behind the key. So anyway, that's a quick summary. Great. Thank you so much for kind of um, summarizing and, you know, also showing how there's almost this new standard, you know, for these new kinds of uh, musical instruments that is uh, evolving and um, uh, becoming established now. Um, I would also like to introduce Peter Kern. Um, Peter is a composer and working in electronic media and a leading voice in expressive technology. His music spans experimental and club sounds with uh, releases on Detroit Underground, Wunderblock uh, Records, Kota Records, and his own establishment, uh, among others, from scored concert music to work with modern dance and techno. He has collaborated with choreographers, fashion designers, and spatial media, as well as playing live and DJing at some of the most notorious, notorious club venues in Berlin and uh, Europe. At the City University of New York, he studied composition with Tanya Leon and co-founded and co-directed the Graduate Center's uh, Contemporary Music Ensemble. He has created and writes daily at Create Digital Music, uh, analyzing the latest in music creation and live visual technology, and co-created and markets the MeBlip hardware synthesizer line. So thank you so much for joining us today, Peter. Um, we have uh, a question from the audience for you. Um, your uh, early musical training has really given you an understanding of the history of musical practice and technology. Um, and so uh, I was curious, um, you know, given your background and your current activity at um, CDM, what can you say now about where instruments are headed in the future? Um, well, that's a, well, that's a big question. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that the difference between me and, and somebody like uh, Roger is my main role has been to be the person having a lot of the conversations with designers and musicians. Um, so even though I'm not such a designer engineer myself, maybe not even enough to get myself into trouble. <laughs> Almost, almost little enough to keep myself out of trouble, but not quite. Um, no, I, I, you know, I think what what's exciting to me is being able to be kind of part of conversations with other people, um, maybe even sort of cheer on directions that they're going, uh, in addition to whatever small contributions I make myself. Um, but we're, you know, we're still in the sort of middle of this computational revolution in musical instruments. Uh, so part of the advantage of doing the website in this kind of daily format, which was not something that I set out to do, um, but because you're because you're sort of writing about things every day, um, you, you you get to kind of refresh your take on what's happening every single day, or sort of look look for what's new or what's sort of happening in the moment. Maybe kind of pan out to a uh, to a bigger view and sometimes kind of look at uh, smaller details. Um, but I you know I think I think the Probably the most important thing to say now is it's not so much the the makeup of the technology as the breadth and depth of the people involved in moving that technology forward. So you can kind of look at music tech in a couple of ways. You could look at it in terms of what synthesis methods are available or what uh, you know what what's it yeah what's like a cool sound making technique. And then you trace things like frequency modulation and John Chowning, or you talk about Max Matthews or, uh, or what have you, and you kind of trace those uh, granular synthesis, trace those technologies. But I, I, to me, part of what's so revolutionary is if you think about how few people used to be involved in this um, and how limited access was to kind of places to work on stuff, um, even, in, even in just the time that I've been working on it, on this stuff, where you know originally I had to go to like a lab somewhere um, and and uh, um, you have places like IRCAM or places like Princeton and um, the, you had to kind of go into this laboratory and do your research there and uh, everybody everybody knows everybody else and there's kind of limited group of people working on it. We have such potential now for so many people to be involved and for the barrier of entry to kind of try experimentation is so low. Um, 
that this is a much broader conversation. It's a conversation that happens in more different languages and more different places than ever before. And so that also means that that all of this technology now interfaces with lots of people with lots of different kinds of musical backgrounds and musical techniques. So I think a lot of the future is there. And you know, the exciting thing is that 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 doesn't make people like me or Roger necessarily less relevant. It gives us it. I think it, to flip that around, it it um, it means we're kind of blessed with you know lots more ideas and lots more stuff happening on the the sort of human input side of this. And I, I don't think that we've even begun to see where that's leading because so many people uh, that fit that description are just now getting started. That it may take another generation or two to really even recognize what the outcome of all of that is. Which is also why it's great to join you all virtually at Georgia Tech. Uh, places like Georgia Tech are even more important when when this really is about uh, more knowledge and kind of more interaction. Great. Um, you know, given what you've described about this whole new ecosystem of you know digital music creation, um, how do your own music instrument designs fit into this new world? Sure. Well, and that, so this is where I think we, we bring my visuals up. Um, so if we look at the first image, it's a good segue from what Roger was talking about with the piano. So there should be image one is a picture of me at a piano in the um, uh, Scriabin Museum. In, uh, wait, I, I hear a chime. Is that chime telling me that that isn't working or is that a question? Um, hopefully you're all seeing me in front of a piano and it's a still image so you have no idea how good i am as a piano player so just imagine that i'm you know spectacular uh but uh this is in the the scriabin museum and you know this this is kind of an image of how a lot of us get involved in in music and the for, for the first time and i think to kind of defend the piano as an instrument you know uh because i think it is often misunderstood especially if you I had the misfortune of having to teach keyboard skills with uh, digital pianos, and they, they don't have any of the kind of, they're not as much fun, right? Uh, nothing against the people manufacturing them. But um, I mean, I think those of us who are really in love with this instrument are in love with the acoustic the acoustic side of this instrument. And so the, the, the thing that's cool about playing this is kind of the same thing that's cool about playing instruments like the gamelan or something it's you know the resonance of uh, an acoustic instrument and all of its complexity is really what makes musicianship so exciting and you're never really alone with these things either so as far you know as far as instrument design um all instruments have some kind of embodiment of compositional ideas and they all give you some sort of experience of the sensation of sound um, so on the, on the piano, it's this really complex world of resonance and all the stuff that's happening in the strings and the wood and everything else. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure where I'm going with this thought, but, the, you know, um, I had that experience as a composer kind of sitting behind this instrument. It's actually part of why I'm here, because it's part of how I got to know Jason Freeman from Georgia Tech um, is through this kind of traditional compositional route. Um, but, you know, for all that people talk about technology and humans and instruments and scores as being somehow kind of separate things, all of these things embody all of these, uh, you know, the rich world of human expression. So I think part of what you do when you're setting up a, a musical instrument or part of what you do, you know, sometimes I build really simple things like really simple patches, really simple presets. Some of them are horrible. But you you find some kind of way of embodying parameters so that you can play with just one element, much as you would as the composer. Um, so it might be just turning one knob or um, you know kind of experimenting with playing with one one thing and seeing how you can jam with that. So if we go to the second image, um, that's why it's been exciting to work on something even as simple as a monophonic synthesizer even as many people have done that before and uh and many people have probably done it better before um the the fun of working with the meblip uh synthesizer with my colleague james graham is this kind of perpetual conversation about figuring out what knobs should do and which knobs to choose and and um uh how to kind of exactly tune them so that you get some sort of musical result. If you see a, image three is also those, uh, a kind of love image about knobs. Um, so the, the, 
the work in this kind of synthesizer design for me and all the conversations that we have are really about translating between um, parameters and compositional ideas and expression. Um, if we go to image four, um, I mean, I, I'm somebody also who, you know, the reason I do this is to perform. This is an image of the audiences that we don't have anymore. Um, but this is from uh, the end of January. Um, but I, you know, I somehow this kind of constantly moving between performance and instrument design and all those conversations that we have are really a chance to, to play with one another with all these ideas. So I think that's really kind of why we do all this stuff. Um, and back to this idea of bringing in other people. Um, one of the projects that I do that I'm most eager to get back to in person, but that we're going to find a way to do virtually, if you look at image five, is a project called the Music Makers Hack Lab, which is a collaborative platform that uh, I first did with the CTM Festival. What well, actually kind of grew out of these um, informal science fair kind of jam sessions that we had in New York. And then I came to Berlin and we began to do these as part of CTM Festival. Uh, they're week long performance laboratories. And, you know, having just shown them the Mieblip and a lot of what you'll see from the Guthman instrument competition focuses on these objects, like the objects that are behind me in this room. Um, I think that that only tells a small part of the story. And so part of why we have such fun in the hack lab is we get to think not just about the technology or the uh, as the object, but as the collaboration and performance rituals that emerge out of all of the stuff that we're doing with these things. So if you look at slide six, more of my background was in theater and performance and music and things than it is in engineering. So I've applied that bias to this project, but uh, part of what we part of what happens in this hack lab is people come from all over the world and um, create these sort of uh, performance scenarios and rituals and uh, they work together and it's really about uh, collaboration. So I, I, the, the technological part is not just about like what instrument you can hack, but how can you work together on something? And then how can you take whatever you've constructed? And maybe it's really quite simple and find a way to play with other people. Because I think that, you know, as we're all in this kind of strange cultural situation where um, we're, we're all kind of hybrids and we're all sort of emerging into evolving as we become more than human and we add all this technology to ourselves, uh, we're looking for ways to relate to each other. And so um, I hope that we continue this. I hope that it works virtually. I'm again, reminded of how, how weird it is to be in a virtual void. Uh, but uh, certainly the thing that we got out of the physical space, if we go to the last image, that's image number seven. Um, there's tons and tons of things that happen when, when people come together and figuring out how to construct these sort of new cultures together um, has been something that's been, to me, kind of the most exciting stuff that we work on. And so I think that, you know, whether it's kind of writing this website or, or whether it's just appearing here into my studio and being alone for a long time, but then finally kind of sharing the output, it's these kind of, it's these kind of points where we come together and try to translate what we're doing to each other and talk about what we're doing to each other. Um, that the, the biggest sort of breakthroughs happen. Great. Um, so uh, that was very interesting to kind of hear your perspective about the role that uh, embodiment, you know, plays in live performance and bringing, you know, people together. I'm really um, curious to hear from our next panelist um, who might have a, a very different opinion about, you know, the role of humans and uh, embodiment um, when it comes to new music uh, instruments. So I'd like to introduce um, Raghav Shankara Narayanan, uh, who is a graduate student in uh, music technology at Georgia Tech. He has invented a novel robotic violin player designed for performing Carnatic music. Using sophisticated mechatronics and music information retrieval techniques, uh, uh, Raghav's robot can play almost all of the musical articulations and ornamentations, including gamakas uh, with intonation. Um, so maybe you could uh, uh, describe to us what a gamaka is. 
Hi, uh, before I start, uh, thank you so much for uh, for this panel. Uh, more than, uh, it's been a very learning experience, like uh, talking to legends like you guys. Uh, so it's been, uh, it's been a great time. So thank you so much for that. Um, so starting to uh, talk about Gamakas. Uh, Gamakas are very special to Indian music form. So Indian music has two, uh, two forms, like North Indian classical music and South Indian classical music. And Gamakas are especially uh, prominent in South Indian classical music. North Indian classical music has a different name for it, but the, the ideology is the same. So what we do is essentially, uh, unlike Western music where each note has its own discrete place, uh, what Gamakas does it, we actually try to bridge two notes, uh, connect two notes when we play it. So when you actually sing a phrase, for example, du, 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 like for example, that's the, like a, a major scale. But in Carnatic music, we don't just sing like that. We actually try to ornament each and every note to have different, um, uh, different like thoughts uh, provoking like different uh, styles. So uh, what we do is that's all gamakas. So gamakas are basically glissandos that actually you play along with the notes to ornament it. So that's a basic definition of it. Would it be yeah. right to assume that that uh, those gamakas are kind of where? a lot of the expressive uh, potential right. in the performance is kind of stored. Yeah, I was searching for the exact word, express, expressivity. It's actually, it actually enhances your expressivity of, uh, of the raga you're singing. So raga is basically a uh, mode or the scale equivalent in Western music. So each raga has its own set of gamakas that you can play. So for example, if you, if you sing a raga called Shankara Bharanam, it's, it's equivalent to a major scale in uh, Western music. So uh, what I sang was Shankara Bharanam, but you cannot sing the same exact Gamaka for another Raga, even though the notes are exactly the same. So that's the beauty of Gamaka. So Gamaka's actually characterize your Raga itself. So it's not just an automation, but it's actually like a deciding authority of uh, what you sing. Interesting. Um, maybe could you uh, show us your instrument and kind of describe how, how you're kind of designing this um, uh, system, you know, that can recreate this kind of expressive uh, uh, form? Sure. Uh, I'm using a laptop, so it's, uh, I need to move the whole laptop to show it. So here is, uh, like, my instrument. Uh, it's basically a robot, uh, not an anthropomorphic robot, but, uh, so, uh, what it does is it plays one single string, if you can uh, see it. So why it plays one single string is because, uh, I took this inspiration from an instrument called Veena or Chitra Veena. Uh, both of these instruments, uh, they actually use the sliders mechanism. Uh, Veena uses fingering, but uh, the Chitra Veena uses slider mechanism. Uh, that requires only one finger to play it. So they play using a slider. So that's the uh, inspiration I got for having this uh, fingering mechanism here. So what it does is it has a fingering mechanism and then a slider mechanism uh, to move all along the string. So that can actually press the uh, string at different pitches. So here, yeah. okay, it's hard for me to hold and play. <laughs> so like that. Um, and for the bowing mechanism, uh, so this uh, is a slightly a, a modified version of an instrument called hurdy gurdy. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. So hurdy gurdy is uh, an instrument that's similar to. Uh, a violin, but it's played using roller wheels. So it's, it doesn't have a bow, but it has roller wheels. And then for the fingers, you have piano-like uh, pr uh, finger presses that you can press along here. So that's how the instrument is played. So they use actually uh, a moving roller wheel made of wood, and then they have it coated with a rosin to have a required friction to play on uh, like the ex inside the string. So I took that as an inspiration, but I modified a little bit to suit uh, what I want to do. So what I did was I made it into two roller wheels. One is actually driven by a BLDC motor. And then I have these strings. These strings are very similar to horse hair, but these are nylon. So these have the same or similar characteristics that uh, that of a bow. So I added these strings along the roller. So when the motor rotates, the roller actually rotates and then the string moves along the roller and then that will actually excite the string. So this mechanism output will be very similar to um, very similar to how you actually play the violin. But the, the plus point of this is that you can actually play infinitely. The bowing, you have to actually stop at some point and then change your bow direction. But you can actually play infinitely in this uh, mechanism. Also, you can play multiple strings at the same time with this. 
So those are some of the plus points and also the space, of course. So you, th this resource is only this much space. But the bow, you cannot, like someone cannot sit near you for sure. They need at least a three feet distance. So that's, that's some of the plus points that I got. Uh, very, very cool. Um, before we actually started our, our panel today, you were mentioning that you have a background in computer science and machine learning. Uh, so I, I wanted to um, reserve this audience question for you. Um, they asked that, they said that the, um, a lot is made of machine learning and other AI models in relation to sound design and synthetic sound generation. What efforts are underway to incorporate uh, AI into practical instrument uh, design? Cool. So um, I myself have asked a lot of times this question. So how I think of this, this is just my opinion, but how I think of it is as uh, when you talk about an instrument or a new instrument, basically it has two, two steps, one input, one output, and you do a lot of uh, intermediate stuff in between that's like a black box. You can do whatever you want. It can be electronics, it can be acoustics, purely acoustic sound, or it can be uh, uh, fully DSP uh, electronic or computer science involved, anything it can be, but it has an output, it has an input. So output, if it's a self-sustained instrument, the output is most probably audio, but uh, it can be also MIDI or a control voltage or anything that you want. That could be the output. The input could be uh, sim as simple as a potentiometer turn to change the pitch or something, or at as heavy as a neuro skull that you install and then you think about it and then it changes pitch. So it can be anything that you want. So uh, when you talk about machine learning or any, any AI, you immediately go into the digital domain. There is no analog domain involved here, uh, right? Because you play with numbers, uh, technically. So uh, what I, how I think of this is, as soon as you get, you get the input, uh, and then you have to transform that into digital domain, now it's a different problem. Now we can think of this as a DSP problem, think of this as another problem. It's, it's no more an instrument design problem. So uh, as soon as you transform this into a different problem, you can use any of the, any of the uh, research that's based on DSP, like, for example, if you take uh, smart pitch tracking, auto tuners, etc., or it can be as simple as playing uh, like a chromatic instrument, but you can actually normalize the notes and then play in uh, in the scale that you want to play. So there has been a lot of instruments, even in uh, this year's Gutman competition, where you can actually limit your notes to just play C major, just play D major for e simplicity. So that can be uh, that that's a simple AI problem. Uh, it's not as complicated as a neural uh, audio synthesis or something, but that's a very simple AI problem. So there has been attempts in doing that too. And to say about some complicated atoms, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Ensynth by uh, Google's Magenta project. So that actually has a hardware built. So what it actually does is it can actually morph between two instruments. So it's like a st style transfer problem. So you can morph between a, a say a flute and a violin or a, or any, any instrument that you want in that case. So it can actually bridge between these two instruments. So that's, that's some of the, uh, uh, like ways that people have been trying to incorporate uh, AI and machine learning uh, in smart instrument design. So basically you can think of this as a DSP problem uh, because you are into a different domain. You can actually apply any of the DSP algorithms or smart algorithms or machine learning algorithms and then uh, incorporate that part into your own instrument and you can make an instrument. So yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, I could probably speak to that too, but I think that's the key point that it's a digital process and a computational process. To flip it around the other way, I would even say, you know, it's a little bit like, if you imagine you always, always had one particular, you know, you always had a, a screwdriver, but never a hammer. We've, we've had such a, a kind of one path uh, approach to how to work with DSP that you wind up with a lot of the same results. So what's exciting to me about the machine learning approaches is that they open up a whole bunch of new pathways. It's probably a little soon to even say how useful those will be, um, but they're, they're, they at least allow some stuff that you weren't able to do before. So if you think about what you want a digital instrument to do, which is a combination of being able to take sounds that you're recording and pull them apart and do stuff with them and to create new sounds, uh, the machine learning stuff that, that we're all working on is relevant to both of those sides of the equation, at least in that they offer some new possibilities. Now, 30 years from now, we might look back and say that particular pathway that we all started walking down was fantastic, or we might say, well, yeah, that remember in 2020 when we thought that was so cool? 
Um, but I, there is some real potential, particularly in terms of like taking sound and, and pulling it apart in the ways that you expect, uh, that your ears would expect, things like source separation. And uh, it is generating a lot of kind of new sounds that are different than the ones that you heard before. Um, you know, this kind of um, brings us to a more general question that the audience asked. Um, and I would like to hear from all of the panelists about this, about where, where do you see um, the new uh, uh, computer music instrument field um, going within the next five years, within that particular time range? Wait, I want to just uh, I want to just kind of question whether people have a short attention span first, and maybe that's relevant to this answer, um, because I mean, apart from well, anybody who's willing to read my site, obviously has a long attention span, uh, and I do sometimes hide little Easter eggs at the ends of articles, and I'm always surprised how many people find them at the ends of articles. So then I know that people are reading to the end for some reason, um, but I, you know, I this. This is something to think about looking at the next few years. There's a danger, actually, in the music industry of us thinking that the thing that we need to do to reach more people is to make music making easier or simpler. And I, I, part of the reason for that is when we work in the music industry all day, we're exhausted by the end of the day. And we may not have, we may not have the mental capacity to kind of go deep in this stuff. But we should remember that for most people, the stuff that they do in music is, is outside of their day job. And a lot of the times what they actually want is depth and something that, that, that they can spend a lot of time on. So I hope that what we do is think more about reducing the time wasting that they spend on things like driver configuration or dealing with our complicated copy protection schemes, or like just dealing with stuff not working and not working together. Because my sense is, especially when we look at industries like the gaming industry, that a lot of people want stuff that they can put really sink their teeth into and that have a lot of depth. And we shouldn't be afraid. I mean, if any 15 years of running this website has taught me anything, uh, you know, I thought that people wouldn't like the kind of nerdy academic stuff that I had. Uh, studied in academia. And what I found was the opposite. People love the nerdiest, weirdest stuff. They love the kind of stuff that's going on at places like Georgia Tech. And they don't necessarily want to be treated like a four-year-old with a busy box, you know, kind of musical experience. Even DJs. D we, D DJs in Berlin get really deep and work really hard at this stuff. Um, so I think, um, especially now as we have more pandemic ahead and people, you can watch what people are interested in, and they want stuff that really gives them uh, depth and, and, and lots of time that they can spend time on. And that's why stuff like Roger's Instrument is so great, because it is something that you actually would enjoy putting in time and learning. Yeah, um, I would like to echo something that Peter said. Uh, I think that in my own work, you know, developing brain music interfaces, I found that the interfaces that have the most expressive potential are the ones that are the hardest to learn and require the most, you know, number of uh, hours or months or years, you know, to be able to master. Um, and so I think that, you know, some, sometimes there is something lost when it comes to music expression, if we're just kind of expecting a, you know, uh, music instrument to instantly be creating music, right? Um, so anyway, um, Ragov? I'm going to add one thing to that. Uh, excuse me, Grace. And that's that um, what I always try to do uh, in an instrument, uh, is to create something that has that magical balance. It's easy to learn, but difficult to master. Because it has to draw you in somehow. I think there is a lot of competition for um, one's focus these days. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I'd spent hours every day after school practicing guitar. And it's, uh, I have to admit, I stopped practicing when I saw how easy it was to have a sequencer play something very fast. Uh, but there is something that's lost, there's something that's gained, and it really depends on the individual. I will say this, though, uh, while it, it is, on the one hand, it's very good that the, all these tools are so accessible to people, so a much larger group of people can enjoy the process of mu music making without so much practice and developing a school skill. But at the same time, what excites me personally is that person that we tend to call in our culture the artist, the person that sees beyond normal uh, vision the person who sees the future that we don't see and, and is able to um, create music 
uh, and, and actually move uh, music in new and different directions. And, and my observation is the, the number of people within our culture that do that hasn't changed all that much. Uh, th there are only so many people that are really doing beautiful things that surprise us in, in beautiful ways and do that consistently. And so the artist, it does take um, work as well to be able to get to that place. It's partly concept, it's partly mind, uh, but it's also a lot of work. It's that 10,000 hours. You know. We actually have right. another related oh. question that uh, maybe Ra Radha could uh, answer for us. Um, somebody in the audience asked, do you think that it is useful or even necessary for electronic musicians to study the fundamentals of music performance uh, coming from the acoustic realm, such as rhythm, harmony, and phrasing? Uh, I would say, like, if it's me, I would definitely read it. I mean, I would definitely study. Knowing music is will will give you its price for sure. Um, as I said before, uh, these electronic or uh, like AI based stuff, they actually help aid you to like. Even if you don't know any chords or something, if you go into Logic, uh, just create a drum track. It will play drums for you. If you create a uh, a MIDI track, and then you can automate the chords for you. But it'll only go to some extent. It'll go only go to a certain extent. So just. Uh, the, the next step or the next level if you want to go, if you want to be unique or if you want to improve upon that, you need to be uh, strong in your basics. You need to be strong in any of the genres that you know. In any one style of music, if you know, you can adopt any other styles of music. But one style of music, is def I definitely recommend that. Also, just to add to the previous question, I thought I should add something else too. So, uh, with respect to computer music, um, so it's actually growing a lot. The thing is, uh, one more thing that I wanted to add to that is that the accessibility of instruments, also the pricing. So uh, before, if you want to learn a violin, you'd actually spend a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars to just get the violin and then just get a good teacher because you cannot learn it on your own. But nowadays, you have YouTube videos. You you have uh, even if you don't want to learn a violin, you can just get your iPhone. Your iPhone runs like hundred thousand apps that you can learn uh, music to, or you can run like like free free resource. There's a lot of free online resources that you can learn to. So that's uh, that's very very good thing, and then that's also increasing the competition. So if you have like hundred apps that's doing very good, when people uh, use all those hundred apps, you need something to compete. So if people will come up with new ideas to actually like uh, to make them unique, and then that will actually I think that will actually grow this industry, and then that will also make uh, people more affordable. So that's that's something I want to add. Um, along the same lines. We have a question about um, how a new uh, instrument designer can um, kind of connect with community, so connect with uh, conductors and performers. How would you recommend that they reach out? Uh, I would say this is this is location specific in the sense that in my country it's it works very differently than in the U.S. So uh, I would say how it happens in my country. So what we generally do is there's a lot of cultural events and competitions that happen. And then they actually, like for us as, as a violinist, I participate in a lot of competition and that gives me a lot of visibility. Or I make my own music videos and then share it with uh, the, uh, say the coordinators or conductors or composers. And then they, they see it and then they like my music. They call me out for a session and then try, try it out and stuff. That's how in our country it works, but I'm not sure how it works in the US. So probably you guys can add to it. I, I can add something there. Um, one thing that's wonderful about uh, the internet is, um, is that ideas uh, spread very quickly, especially good ideas. Um, and um, guys like Peter with CDM, it's a great place to discover new ideas. And I think Peter made a very good point. Everyone isn't dumb. They actually seek out new ideas. I think there's a very big new idea culture of people that read these sites. And so let's say you have an instrument idea, whether it's software or hardware or something like that. You make a video, you post it to YouTube, you run it up the flagpole and you see who salutes. And Peter will see these things, he'll find them, the world will get around and other sites too. And they'll publish these things because they know people want these ideas. It may not be an instrument that's ready for production. And it may be an unpolished idea, but if there's a gem of an idea that's really valuable, uh, that's something valuable, and the word spreads quickly. The trick is, is to follow it up and finish it. <laughs> but in doing so, in spreading that idea, especially if you have a website or a way to be contacted, uh, these sites like, like CDM will, will, will publish that information, and people who 
resonate with that idea will will contact you and, and you'll develop your own community. You develop an email list or you know a Facebook group or something like that. And uh, and those those people will find you if if your idea has enough merit to become a, a meme. And, and if it doesn't, you probably need to modify your idea a little bit, get it better. Also, and, it, and it will explode into. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I Wait, just wanted see. to mention that our Guthman competition is also another way to kind of um, spread your idea to the world. Um, I wanted to. Uh, remind our audience that you can still uh, access our um, finalist video gallery um, at our website, which is guthman.gotech.edu slash gallery. Um, and uh, while you're there, um, please also check out the information that we have about the Georgia Tech um, School of Music as well at um, music.gotech.edu. Um, so I, I want to thank Peter, Roger, and uh, Raghav for uh, joining us today for the panel, um, and hopefully we're going to see you all at uh, the Guthman competition in March. Thank you, Thank you all. Absolutely.